All right. Hello, and um, yeah, welcome. Um, I realize I'm everything that's uh, standing between you and your lunch, so I try to um, uh, try to be on time, and um, I think I can make uh, the time here worthwhile. Um, well, the, the whole point of uh, this talk is to give uh, an overview of uh, what actually is uh, currently going on in the, si um, in the world of malware, um, what attacks we are currently seeing, and then also to uh, discuss a little bit uh, what countermeasures currently are effective and uh, what direction uh, the development of uh, those countermeasures are taking. Cybercrime has become a real big business and recently there were some cases that finally actually document how big those um, incidents are. Um, one, recent, uh, one recent example is a cybercrime ring that uh, got busted just a couple of weeks ago. And um, the FBI in combination uh, with a bunch of other um, services were following them for a little bit over a year. And in that period of time, that uh, cyber crime ring, with the, zoo, uh, with the help of an um, of, um, of the, of the shelf Trojan, they have been using zoos for the operations, um, was able to cause damages in excess of 70 million US dollars. And they were actually trying to do damages um, um, of, of around about 220 million US dollars. Um, the uh, part of that damage could be averted because uh, the authorities already were on their heels. So that's just one case to give you an, uh, to give you an impression about uh, what we are talking about if we are talking about international cybercrime, the motivation they have, and then also what resources they do have available. Um, yesterday I tried to Google a little bit around about the biggest bank case, and I, um, I found actually one bank case that was bigger. Um, um, after the uh, initial bombing of Iraq, apparently someone stole one billion US dollars from some bank in Iraq. Um, apart from that, I think this is uh, like the biggest bank case so far in history. And it was not just one single bank case, but uh, hundreds of small businesses uh, that have been targeted uh, by this operation. Another, another example where a lot of money is to be made is in the, uh, in the world of scareware, fake antivirus, fake system tools. Um, I was talking about this last year in a little bit more detail about an operation uh, that we followed for a while. And uh, this operation uh, now uh, also has been uh, sentenced in the US, um, or more or less the, uh, the head people of, that, of this operation have been sentenced uh, to like, pay back damages. Um, of 163 million US dollars uh, that they have been uh, causing. Um, here it says just to Americans. I, I think that uh, that is an error. Uh, it's probably worldwide. Um, but again, another example of why we're seeing this whole past of different fake antivirus products, scareware things. It's just a lot of money that uh, the people can be made uh, can be made uh, that uh, can be made by that. This, this is, uh, doesn't happen very often, but uh, does Ralph Philipp Weinmann happen to be in here? Because uh, he's, he should report to the uh, registration desk right away. So if you happen to know him, can contact him, Mr. Weinmann, please register at the desk. Thank you. Yeah, no worries, I could grab some water in that time. Yeah, then another example of why it's uh, worth not only for big cyber crime rings to operate, but also for indi individuals and smaller operations. Uh, there still is a thriving underground market, and this underground market, uh, well, basically you can pretty much buy and sell every service uh, that you want to have. And uh, the cyber criminals are also shifting their business models. Ten years ago, they were uh, just uh, um, buying and selling credit card numbers and credit card numbers have become essentially worthless. 10 years ago, they traded for like um, uh, maybe $10 each, and nowadays they are trading for 10 cent if you do get any money for that. So that's a price drop of like 99%. But then cyber criminals just move on to new targets, and new targets are now complete dumps of the magnetic stripes, or uh, well, all the information that is necessary to recreate those dumps. And uh, they are still being uh, traded for quite a lot of money. And um, so it's still worth uh, trying to get those information. It's no longer worth trying to steal credit card from uh, end users. 
but it is worth to break into financial institutions, uh, people, um, companies who are uh, doing um, payment processing, uh, where you can uh, steal this kind of data and get rich by it. This is all made very easy by its, um, well, it's all the tools that you want to have being available for sale um, on the black market. Those tools um, are, being um, are professionally developed and uh, are constantly being improved. And the prices uh, vary uh, quite a lot, um, as we will see on the next slide. Um, but, well, if you want to start a cybercrime empire, all you need to do is first learn Russian or learn how to use Google translation tools to get uh, through, the, uh, through the underground forums. Um, buy or well, take a uh, pirated illegal copy of one of those toolkits and then you can pretty much uh, start your own empire with that. This is a, uh, an example of one of the most prolific uh, um, toolkits, Zeus. Um, Zeus has been around since uh, 2006 and this is uh, just an overview of the different version of Zeus that we are available, uh, that we are aware of. It's not necessarily com uh, absolutely complete, so if you have got a version that we don't have, we would like to see that. And uh, with the uh, development of, uh, um, of Zeus, it kind of gives an impression of um, how those underground or crime toolkits are being developed, what new improvements are being made, and also the fluctuation in prices. Zeus was available for pretty much every amount between 500 US dollars and over 10,000 US dollars, just depending on if there was something new, cool added to it um, that made it more easy for, us, uh, for criminals uh, to use it. And now with Zeus, there is a very interesting uh, thing happening um, over the last couple of weeks again. Um, there is another uh, toolkit that just appeared at the end of last year and that has also become fairly popular. Um, SpyEye, and a couple of weeks ago, the authors be uh, behind SpyEye uh, posted on various forums that they have been taking over the source code from Zeus, that uh, Slavic, the, it's, um, probably the one person who was behind Zeus, uh, lost interest and uh, would stop development, uh, developing Zeus. And um, so it's, um, now it's, um, people who have been using SpyEye can upgrade uh, to Zeus uh, for a small amount of money. And what's very interesting is that only the, uh, the author of SpyEye had anything to say. Um, Slavic hasn't been heard of uh, for the last couple of months, so I'm not quite sure if he just got lost somewhere um, out in the woods or something. So that may be an interesting development there. And uh, the problem there now is that, that uh, two, well, let's say really good, really dangerous uh, toolkits um, are being merged together. So let's see what's, uh, what's happening out of there. Um, with the available of such, uh, availability of such toolkits for everyone, everyone can just like download, install uh, like his own Trojan creator and then just run it to create Trojans, check uh, against current antivirus software to make sure that it's not detected when he's sending out. Um, this had uh, some quite dramatic changes um, on, the, um, um, on the landscape of malware. People just created more and more uh, Trojans uh, to, uh, that were not detected by signature-based AV at the moment of their creation, sent it out, and then the next day they would just create more versions. And uh, this is an arms race that, um, has been, uh, that had been started in 2006 and that unfortunately is still going on um, fairly, fairly strong. Um, currently, we are seeing around about 60,000 unique uh, binaries, or uh, unique new Trojans mostly, um, on, on each and every day. So that's a race that is really hard to win with signature-based antivirus. Actually, I would say that race has been lost to signature-based antivirus. Um, new technologies um, uh, needed, to be, uh, needed to be developed uh, to try to cope with that. For one thing, in the back end um, of antivirus producers or anti-malware producers, um, we are relying very heavily on automation nowadays, automa uh, automatic analysis, as you can imagine. I mean, 60,000 Trojans a day, how many thousand researchers would you need uh, uh, to, to even try to um, add detection for that uh, manually? And then, well, new technologies, especially all the cloud-based security services, of which I will be talking later about, 
um, have gained uh, quite a lot of importance uh, to actually successfully fight against uh, that wave of malware. Then when, uh, when we are looking about um, on the like, top 10 different pieces of malware that we have seen, uh, that we have seen globally, um, we see one interesting thing, adware suddenly has been, um, has been coming back. We pretty much thought uh, the, the problem of adware that had, um, well, that's something of the past. We didn't really see much adware lately. And uh, now it seems uh, some people have figured out uh, that they can, uh, um, instead of distributing fake antivirus software or something like that, that uh, they can just uh, distribute old style adware with the same methods as uh, kind of drive-by downloads um, where um, vulnerabilities in browsers, et cetera, are exploited to install adware on hundreds of thousands of machines and getting paid uh, the money for, uh, for the installations. Apart from that, number one detection worldwide is still an autorun worm. Autorun worms are a little bit, uh, well, on, uh, um, well, we see less than we have seen some months ago, but they are still really, really strong. Uh, that it still seems that many people are, aren't really thinking about USB sticks, cameras, anything that basically is, um, is a, a USB storage that can be made to, uh, to automatically run. And that's kind of weird. I mean, uh, people have been talking about that uh, now for years, that they are dangerous, and it's fairly easy to completely turn off autorun nowadays. Um, but even within companies, apparently this, um, is not, uh, this is not done a lot. With so many criminals trying to get, um, well, trying to get information from people's PCs, but also using botnets to send out spam and other things, um, we, are, uh, we are still seeing a strong growth in the number of uh, machines that, are, uh, that become zombies uh, each month. Currently, it's, um, uh, we are still uh, seeing around about 6 million new PCs every month uh, that are uh, new members of botnets. And we do expect uh, a, rise, uh, in, um, a rise here. Um, many of you have probably noticed that Bredo Lab, one of the biggest botnets on the planet, um, has been taken down a couple of months ago. And that botnet probably had something around about 30 million computers in it. And um, that, uh, there will certainly be um, other botnets that try to take the space that Bredo Lab has been taking. We've, we've seen that before uh, when a bunch of other uh, botnets have been taken down, that there uh, suddenly was a real increase in the number of new infections each month. Each month. So um, that number is very likely to go up again. Yeah, then uh, malware within social networks, uh, mostly Kubeface. Um, interestingly, we have seen a lot less uh, variants of Kubeface than we have before. And even more interesting, uh, we have uh, seen now variants of Kubeface uh, that try to check uh, what kind of operation system uh, it is you're running. And they can and will also successfully infect a Mac. So it's, um, that may be the last warning call that you have. If you still think, I'm running a Mac, I'm automatically immune to all malicious threats, um, think again. Fake security software is obviously still, uh, still going really, really strong. And it's interesting to see that uh, innovative marketing Ukraine has been taken down. Um, and they were uh, 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 responsible for, for, uh, for right about 50% um, of the fake AV market um, uh, back then. And when they got uh, taken down, there was a visible dent in the total number of uni unique samples that we have seen. And now other companies have taken over that business, have filled the gap, and we are still seeing something around about uh, 150 to 200,000 new and unique um, fake AV things um, uh, on a monthly <coughs> basis. Um, yeah, so back to Zeus again as uh, well. One, one of the toolkits that is well most widely used uh, by uh, by uh, criminals. Um, there are lots of different campaigns uh, that people are running with Zeus, and it's kind of interesting to see where, uh, where the different campaigns, when they are spamming out uh, Zeus Trojans uh, back, to the, uh, back to the world. Um, some of those campaigns are really limited in focus as to which countries they are attacking or in which countries uh, people, um, those emails are being sent. And uh, then some other campaigns uh, are just going globally uh, without any clear targets. Um, so um, that's, well, 
kind of interesting to see is, uh, where people are trying to, uh, to launch their attack, where people are trying to get uh, computers infected and get them in part of the, um, in part of the botnet. And again, to give you an idea of um, how many different groups are running Zeus campaigns, um, th this is like the, uh, the number of websites that we are tracking uh, that are hosting Zeus binaries. Um, so um, the, uh, the number is fluctuating, but uh, there are um, at any given time around about uh, 1,000 to 2,000 um, different big enough operations that we actually discover them. Um, running zoos to create their own botnet to, uh, to try to steal banking credentials to cause financial damage. So again, quite a big problem on that side. And again, with, uh, with zoos, uh, there was an interesting uh, development uh, a couple of months ago um, where there um, now is an add-on for zoos that um, is actually meant to be run on, uh, on a smartphone basically it's, uh, to, uh, to enable the attacker to get behind uh, two-factor authentication where a bank uh, is sending uh, you an SMS on your mobile phone uh, to verify uh, your transaction. So this is not a widespread uh, danger at the moment, it's more like a proof of concept showing that this can be done. Um, but this unfortunately all, um, also shows that the attackers are already thinking ahead, new security measures, um, what can the attackers do to get around those new security measures to um, make sure that uh, they still can maintain their stream of income. Um, for distributing malware, um, well, drive-by downloads are still a big thing. And um, uh, to get people to their websites, um, there are basically still two, two attacks um, happening. For one thing, automated, mostly SQL injection attacks on websites, on web pages, uh, to get iframes uh, in one form or the other, pointing to an attack or exploit server. And uh, the other one uh, is uh, to, uh, to poison search terms. In particular, if a disaster is happening, that's a very good opportunity uh, for a criminal to, uh, to set up a web page and uh, get uh, this web page ranked really high in, uh, uh, within Google search. So if there's, um, well, if you Google for Haiti, um, it's uh, like not really easy to, um, uh, to poison Google in, uh, such that your search term appears really high. And then why would people Google for Haiti in the first way? If there is a major earthquake in, ha in Haiti, then suddenly people start Googling for Haiti earthquake and that combination has not been used so much before, so that makes it really easy to, uh, to, uh, to launch a bunch of web pages that, that at least for a day gets you on the top 10 of uh, Google search results. Same um, if an artist dies or something like that, poisoning Michael Jackson as a search term is fairly difficult. Poisoning Michael Jackson death at the moment when he dies um, that's fairly easy to, uh, to poison until the major news agencies come up with that. And uh, then um, those, uh, those uh, searches take you to sites that uh, either also try to attack you by way of drive-by downloads or are ju uh, just using other social engineering uh, measures, mostly pointing to some kind of fake video where unfortunately you need to download a codec to, uh, to see that video. And, uh, the, uh, the providers um, are so nice that you actually cl can click anywhere on that video and the codec download starts immediately. And there are still many, many thousands of people falling for such kind of scams um, on a daily basis. Uh, when we were looking a little bit about uh, um, Google search terms and um, how dangerous they are, um, we figured out uh, that um, on uh, in 60 percent of the top Google search terms um, there, is, uh, there are malicious sites uh, within the first uh, 100 search results. So that was uh, kind, of a, well, kind of a scary outcome when, uh, when we um, looked um, at that kind of things. Then, um, well, um, another, um, another view of um, the data that we have, with our web and domain reputation services, we do uh, track quite a lot of uh, different, uh, well, quite a lot of different categories of websites. And currently, by, uh, by far, the biggest category is malicious websites. Uh, that doesn't mean that malicious websites are so much more common than anything else. It's just that we are actively trying to hunt them down. So don't let yourself be confused as uh, malicious uh, sites being the number one on this list. 
However, what's a little bit worrying is the total number of sites uh, that we currently are aware of that are hosting malware, that are hosting exploits, um, that are trying to, uh, to damage, uh, well, trying to, uh, to do some kind uh, of damage to people who visit those sites. And that's also posing a little bit of a problem of trying to get those sites down. Um, if you go to any known registrar and uh, say, hey, I've got this list of one million websites uh, that violate your terms of services, would you please start to take them down? I think that's a pretty good denial of service attack against any of those. Yeah, then um, the biggest problems uh, that many uh, corporations are currently facing um, are targeted attacks. Um, we have seen a, a number of targeted attacks being talked about in the media. Um, but the, those are uh, normally the chosen few. Most of you have uh, heard about Operation Aurora, I guess, um, at the beginning of this year. Um, there are a number of other attacks that also are getting some media attention, uh, but m mostly all those targeted attacks are flying completely below, below the radar. Um, the, the, the companies um, and organizations that are being attacked typically, typically don't uh, hold a press conference. Um, saying, yeah, we've been attacked and this is what they stole and yeah, it's a little bit embarrassing, but it's just the way it is. This doesn't happen. Um, what happened um, in this case um, is uh, that um, a senior Pentagon officer um, released information about an incident um, where it's, um, um, well, where basically it's, um, <coughs> The, uh, where basically the military's central command uh, net, uh, network has been compromised by such a targeted attacks. And that's probably one of the best defended networks on the planet. And um, if that network can fall its uh, victim to such targeted attacks, then you can just imagine um, that uh, uh, for targeted attacks, um, they do happen on a daily basis and it's really, really difficult uh, to, uh, to, completely, um, to completely attack against them. Then also with targeted attacks, uh, there is a difference uh, that should be made. Um, many people nowadays are all the, all the time ta uh, talking about advanced persistent threats just because uh, someone sent you a document uh, that is more or less uh, social engineered for your needs. Um, there is a difference between a targeted attack that uh, just an attacker is doing against maybe you personally or against um, a corporation. And uh, then if he sees, well, this attack was not successful, he just moves on to the next target. And then the so-called APTs, uh, where there typically is an organization behind that tries with a lot of resources and um, over a long period of time, again and again, to get some foothold into your network. And those are the uh, most uh, dangerous attacks uh, to, uh, to, um, um, as far as it comes to stopping. For example, it's, um, one ongoing attack against uh, international European uh, banking uh, institutions is uh, pretty much always geared uh, around the, uh, the G20. And uh, this, th this kind of attack has been going on at, uh, for many, many months now, where every now and then um, a new wave of attack is being sent to um, a singled out target within various of those banking organizations throughout Europe. So that's just one, uh, one example of one of those um, attacks that, um, that no one really talks about that happens in the background. And there are many, many more. If you're, um, if you're a company that deals something uh, uh, with military um, equipment, um, then you certainly are a target. If you're a government organization, you constantly are a target. And uh, people will try over and over again to just get at you. They do have the resources in place uh, to, to support those attacks. Um, uh, very often when there is a, um, well, a bigger event, uh, we, uh, we see that there have been O-days used that uh, so far, uh, um, that so far uh, were not, well, or at least have not been seen anywhere else. And O-days are pretty expensive. So if you already um, have the money available to dish out 50K for a cool O-day to get at someone's computer, um, that means uh, you're more than just a normal cyber criminal who is running that attack. Then very often we have seen that uh, the attacker are using customized malware and of course they are making sure that no signature based antivirus uh, product on the planet is uh, detecting that customized malware at the moment they are sending it out. And surprisingly then some of the bigger operations they just use off the shelf malware. 
for example, GhostNet, an operation against a lot of international institutions in combination with uh, TVET. Um, they just use, I think it was Poison Ivy, uh, just your average uh, downloaded, uh, configure it to your needs uh, kind of malware. And then we see that uh, the social engineering factor of those targeted attacks is getting better. Um, it's no longer that uh, people are just sending out an email, here's this cool attachment, and why don't you just open it and click on it. Um, very often those, um, those attacks are now uh, using different attack vectors. Um, fairly often we are seeing now in, um, instant messaging and uh, social networking sites like Facebook being used uh, to carry out those attacks instead of just sending out the, your average email with attachment. So those um, attacks are going on um, constantly. And I guess I can't really talk about any uh, ongoing attacks in the malware world without touching Stuxnet. Um, I'm not going to bore you to death with Stuxnet, uh, just well, a fairly short summary maybe for those two people in the room who haven't heard um, of it. Um, Stuxnet uh, basically it's, um, was well, like the first kind of um, well, malware weapon that we've seen. It appears uh, to have been specifically written to detect uh, a certain piece of hardware um, that, is, uh, that is being monitored uh, by a computer. Um, that certain piece of hardware is um, well, pretty certain, or at least the researchers from Symantec are pretty certain, that it is an uh, uh, uranium enrichment centrifuge. And um, if it would find that piece, of, uh, that piece of hardware, it would just change the operating parameters of it, um, changing, um, changing it in a way that probably either will uh, break the hardware or maybe break the process. And Stuxnet apparently was uh, meant to specifically target uh, um, well, one side. And um, it, it was written with a lot of care to not, to do, uh, to not do collateral damage in the way it really made sure that it is this specific piece of hardware it can attack. Um, otherwise, it would just spread. And uh, in spreading, it used a number of different ODAs. One of the ODAs uh, was an LNK vulnerability that hits all versions of Windows back to Windows 95. And that vulnerability alone was probably already worth hundreds of thousands um, on the black market if you happen to sell it. And uh, it uses at least three other ODAs and um, it looks like uh, there may be even uh, more things that, that have been used to spreading. So uh, there may be even more news about Stuxnet um, in, uh, in the future. Well, I said the authors uh, were uh, careful to not, uh, to, to not to, uh, do collateral damage. Uh, I guess the authors, the authors failed completely. Um, when they choose to create uh, Stuxnet as a worm, um, sooner or later, worms tend to get out of control and affect other things. And in fact, Stuxnet uh, was uh, detected maybe one year after the initial attack, um, simply because it uh, went out of control and was seen um, at some other sites. And uh, now Stuxnet um, has been seen on a global basis. Um, the, uh, the data that actually is, um, is behind this data is not from companies being infected. This is data from our consumer product uh, uh, that offers the ability to, uh, to report back to us if the user opts in. Unfortunately, we don't get any reports from, uh, uh, from uh, corporate sites um, how many of those are seeing Stuxnet or are being infected by Stuxnet. And there were, were report in the, reports in the news that um, in particular China was struggling with quite a lot of Stuxnet infections, uh, but that again is really uh, difficult to verify. So even an, at an attack uh, that was so targeted as, as Stuxnet, simply because they choose like a worm as, a, as their well, attack vector, is running out of control and is spreading um, around the world and it's well, kind of difficult uh, to actually uh, remove a Stuxnet um, installation. Well, then um, there's um, this in the cloud thingy that uh, uh, people have been talking about over the last year as the silver bullet uh, to solve all your problems. Um, if you're looking um, at uh, the cloud services um, um, a little bit uh, more in detail, um, they are basically um, around uh, uh, since three years, and uh, by now pretty much um, antivirus vendor has implemented uh, well those um, in the cloud security um, uh, services in one way or the other. 
So here is an example of uh, um, how those basically it's, uh, basically it's, uh, work. Um, no one is really giving too much information on a technical level of how exactly they, um, they are working. Um, the basic idea is um, there is a new file on a computer that for, uh, comes uh, by email, web, uh, network or whatever vector. And uh, there is no detection uh, with signature or normal heuristics. However, the file is uh, suspicious. Suspicious means, um, for example, if it is an autorun file, then we always think it's suspicious and we will also, um, always uh, ping, um, ping such a cloud query. Um, and there are other factors for files um, where files are matching certain criteria um, that uh, make them look suspicious. Um, and then, uh, well, what happens is that the, the cloud is queried. So it's, um, we are using DNS, others are using OpenSSL to exchange that kind of information. And what is being sent then is basically a fingerprint of the file and uh, some additional metadata. I will uh, come back to that some additional metadata, uh, metadata point later. And then that fingerprint is compared to um, well known other fingerprints um, in the, um, that, um, 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 on, that are available on the backend server. And um, then, uh, well, the result is being returned. Yeah, this is a known malicious file, or no, no, this is a cool file. We know it's in our whitelist, or it's somewhere in the, in the blacklist um, in between. And then the information is getting back uh, to, um, to the client that queried. So basically, what um, all this is getting you is a lot of speed in detection. Um, which is currently the major benefit of all those cloud services. At the, at the moment when a new piece of malware is being um, normally automatically, pr automatically processed by an anti-malware vendor, he immediately updates the central cloud services and then detection is available globally for everyone without updating uh, the current antivirus, uh, the current uh, signature files. So this is a lot of speed uh, that uh, you can gain with it. And this is also th uh, the speed necessary to even think about being successful in uh, fighting against this flood of Trojans uh, that is around. If you look at the basic idea, however, you see it's like not really that new. Basically, all those magic in the cloud security things, they are, well, compare them to file reputation services. And now reputation services have been around for a long time. They have been uh, around to fight spam, they have been around uh, to, to warn um, of malicious websites, etc. Um, so it's, um, you, um, uh, this is also it's, um, where, uh, where the combination of different reputation services in the future may make more sense. There are two major problems uh, with uh, the current implementation, implementations of um, all those um, in the cloud security services. Um, most of those are at the moment comparing uh, well, fingerprints, uh, digital um, uh, cryptographic hashes of a file and then determining yeah this file is good or this file is evil. And uh, one attack against, um, against this kind of uh, detections is of course true server side polymorphism. If you've got a piece of malware on a server side that every time when you uh, try to download it uh, just some bits are being changed. Um, this will throw those cloud security services well, completely off. And uh, then the other problem is the detection is obviously only available when you're online. Um, in most cases, except for um, auto run malware, uh, you can't really uh, infect your computer if you're not online, not realistically. Um, but there's also another scenario uh, to which I'll come back later. That is, you've got an outbreak situation in a network and uh, the piece of malware that is breaking out is actually not detected with signatures at the moment, uh, but with information that is in the cloud. Um, because your policy says, oh, in a case of outbreak, I need to turn down, my, uh, shut down my internet gateway uh, to make sure no data is being transmitted to the outside world. And boom, there goes your detection for that piece of malware that you're currently struggling with. So that's another situation uh, where companies uh, suddenly uh, found, hmm, with my old policies, I can't really fight that piece of malware any longer. So it's, um, that's uh, another, another interesting uh, problem that uh, needs to be addressed in the future. 
So it's, um, currently it's um, with the, it's, um, in the cloud services. Uh, we, are, uh, we are kind of playing in the, um, in the, um, in the area of real-time um, protection, our real-time detection of uh, new malicious files. And well, uh, current developments um, are going into the uh, more predictive um, uh, area um, that, um, that we are using more information, more metadata um, to, uh, to try to create uh, more generic detections. Well, I was uh, mentioning that basically all those cloud security things for detection of malware basically are just a file reputation. And uh, there are other reputation services out there. So one uh, development that is going on at the moment on a large scale is to take all the different uh, reputation services um, and correlate the information um, that, um, is, that we are getting back. Um, all the reputation services, if you look up an email, um, 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 no, um, an email server to figure out if it is in a black hole server, uh, black, if it is in a black hole list, uh, you, as uh, the one who asked the query, you are getting the information, yeah, it's in the black hole list or it's not in the black hole list. Uh, the one who's running the reputation service is getting the information, hey, this uh, server has been asked uh, for to check. And uh, same as, similar is true for pretty much all the reputation services. If uh, someone, uh, um, if a client runs Artemis, uh, then we get the information uh, roughly in this regional on the planet, suddenly th uh, someone was looking up this fingerprint. Um, with our domain reputation services, if someone um, uses SiteAdvisor uh, to, uh, to, to check a website before he's browsing there, um, then we get the information, hey, this website has been asked for. So there is a lot of data that uh, can be correlated um, um, in the background. And that's just something that um, we and also others are just, uh, just about starting to do now. To, get you, to give you an idea of what kind of data we are talking about, obviously I'm not in, in the position of data that other vendors um, have. They don't normally talk about it. Uh, but at least here's uh, the, uh, the total number of data that we are getting. Um, we typically, uh, within a month, are getting north of 100 billion queries in the uh, various reputation services that we have. And this is a lot of data uh, that, uh, uh, that can be mined. Uh, to figure out uh, correlations between a malicious piece of software, um, sites, where, um, sites where we have seen it on, um, then other sites uh, that have been, um, um, other domains uh, that have been registered by the same kind of person, or other domains that are running within the same kind of bad, uh, uh, bad IP, IP reputation. Um, then if you, uh, if you know those other sites, send all crawlers to it and uh, start downloading things. Um, there's a lot of information that uh, can be correlated and um, basically we are just starting doing that uh, um, right now. So that's uh, something that will yield more results in the future, getting all the different services together. An example of um, how, this, um, how this kind of correlations um, is starting to work. Um, um, in this case, a domain has been um, registered and flagged uh, because the register has been known to, uh, to register other malicious domains before. And uh, sometimes later, suddenly that domain was used in a massive iframe attack uh, that was linking to that domain. So uh, then we already knew, yeah, that domain is evil, so uh, we, uh, that, uh, that link was blocked. But then also we got notified there is now massive request for that domain we better take a look of uh, what is going on there so, we, uh, uh, so that we could then hunt down the iframe attack itself and then also hunt down the, uh, the malware um, that, uh, uh, that finally was being distributed by this kind of attack. So um, this is like um, what, what will be happening in the background more and more uh, with, these, uh, with those services. Well, I was um, already saying um, well, uh, that at um, for the file reputation services, basically a, fi a digital fingerprint is being sent and some metadata. Uh, that metadata is a little bit interesting and um, you really should ask your um, AV vendor what exactly um, he is transmitting. Um, in our case, uh, what we are transmitting in addition is a, a very rough um, um, information. This file came from USB or web download or it um, came, uh, came from a network. And um, 
if there would be more metadata like file name, behavior, etc., um, then this would uh, uh, this would make make it possible to, to create much well much more effective detection. Um, then on the other side, we need to be really really careful of what kind of metadata uh, what, that basically belongs to the customer we are sending to us. So this will be like kind of a balance act for the future. Um, I was uh, talking about server-side polymorphism as a very easy way to throw off uh, cloud-based, um, well, cloud-based, uh, uh, cloud-based uh, um, detection. Um, however, if you ha if you have uh, just a little bit more information about the file itself, uh, maybe it's um, maybe about its basic behavior it's, um, in the first moment it is running. Um, then uh, suddenly server-side polymorphism is not a problem any longer to detect like all the programs uh, that have been um, created with a certain, um, with a certain um, yeah, engine um, online. Then to finish it off, um, I've, I did already mention the problems um, of being infected and you don't know it but we know about it in the cloud. This is uh, the kind of, uh, kind of scenario that uh, well, simply can happen if uh, detection is not available with a local uh, product, but just with a cloud service. Um, where you have got the problem if the cloud service is not available, maybe because you shut down the gateway, maybe because someone was trying to be funny and DDoS it away. Um, for any of those reasons, um, well, this can get you in a, a quite of a difficult uh, situation. So another uh, development in the field of, um, of cloud uh, security services is to like, move that cloud or move at least part of the cloud back into your network um, so that you've got like, a copy of the cloud that is, still be, uh, that is still available in case the real cloud is not there. So th uh, this is currently it's, um, another development that is going on um, when it's, uh, relying more and more on those reputation services. Obviously, we need to make sure that those reputation services are also available in case, well, simply it's, um, our services are not online. Then to finish it all off, there are a couple of more um, technologies that are still, well, waiting on the horizon to, uh, to make a bigger impact. Um, for, ap for application control or whitelisting, um, people basically have been talking about whitelisting as a better solution for the better part of 20 years now. And um, currently it never really took off. The major problem of whitelisting is, uh, well, for one thing, there are a lot of more known non-malicious files than there are malicious ones. Um, if you look at the website of Bit9, they used to have uh, they used to have a counter of the number of known uh, white applications that they are monitoring, and while malicious uh, uh, applications are now in the 50 million, um, they were talking more about six billion known whitelist hashes. And uh, then another issue was that, uh, for such a, a solution to scale uh, within a larger network with so many different pieces of software that um, continuously want to update themselves. Um, with, recent, uh, well, um, with the recent versions of those various, various uh, whitelisting applications, um, um, it is well, now, at least for servers, uh, kind of possible to use uh, those to, uh, to protect your servers. And I would really suggest that you uh, monitor what's going on there or take a look at it. Um, whitelisting actually is the best approach uh, to uh, protect servers, especially against targeted attacks. It's much more efficient than relying on an antivirus technology where you know the attacker uh, has been doing his QA before and make sure that technology is not effective against this particular attack. Then another thing that uh, well, people were talking about a lot and uh, nothing, no one really has seen any results is in real behavior-based detection. Um, Behavior-based detection will be a supporting technology for extending uh, the current uh, detection that uh, can be achieved with cloud-based services. Um, you, you still uh, probably won't see many products uh, claiming they are doing like full behavior detection and actually uh, detecting something with it. Um, it is very difficult to determine uh, the difference between a non-malicious ser uh, service and a malicious service just based on behavior. 
most of you uh, well know what I'm talking about. If you take a debugger and just run um, run a comparison, what kind of um, uh, what kind of system calls is VNC making? What kind of system call is Netbus making? And how the hell is the software supposed to tell the difference if you hardly can with a debugger? And uh, then, so, well, um, other technologies uh, that um, uh, also have been used with the net visualizations or have been discussed with the net vis visual visualization in the talk before. Um, in, on the network, you can detect a lot of Trojan activities, a lot of malicious traffic, really, really easy. You just have to look and you just have to need the right tools to visualize it. And that's, uh, well, technology that is uh, still being worked on, still is like in fairly early stages. And then you've got a treasure uh, cove in inside your network that you probably uh, kind of know about it, but don't really care about it. Um, if, uh, when so we're doing forensics in a case where there has been like a um, Trojan uh, inside a network, uh, normally the best source of information is to look at the DNS server. And of course, you can also look at your DNS server before um, it is actually a case for forensics. A lot of worms, a lot of Trojans uh, will appear in your DNS server as something that it looks irregular. Um, you just need uh, to find, uh, find ways how to siphon uh, through all the data. All right, uh, then I think it's just about uh, time for lunch. I'm still around for any, uh, for any, uh, for any more questions for the, um, um, uh, today and tomorrow. So just grab me either at lunch or at the, uh, later at the bar. And uh, with that, I thank you for your patience. And any questions? Are there any questions? Please try. Please be bold. Just signify questions. I think they're all hungry. Hmm. Well, does anybody know some guys from the other side about bringing them here to speak, maybe in, in ninja form? <laughs> we keep hearing about there's so many uh, means that the other side has to actually do create botnets or whatever. How do we know this? Do you have any connections? <laughs> um, well, most of, the, uh, most of it is uh, just intelligence that we are getting uh, when um, well, analyzing a piece of malware, then obviously we know where it tries to connect to. And then, well, we just uh, uh, check what's, uh, what is uh, there on the other side. And, um, um, a lot of the data that um, has been presented uh, was, is also like a correlation of the, all the different reputation services that we've got. And then all of, also our researchers are curious humans. Um, so most of the information about certain botnets, about uh, certain Trojan kits, etc., um, that typically comes from, uh, comes from researchers that very often in a spare time um, is taking a deeper look at a certain piece of malware that you've got, uh, trying to figure out where does it come from, who's behind that, um, trying to browse through forums. It, it, it is surprising um, how, uh, how easy it is to get in, uh, to get in uh, a lot of underground forums or just use Google Cache to get uh, the, uh, those uh, sites displayed and then use Google Language Tool to get a translation of the Google Cache site. It's kind of cumbersome, uh, but it works. And uh, then uh, you, uh, you get also a lot of information about uh, what, well, what the criminals are currently up to. It's like kind of not, uh, not our day job, but that's something that we well, pretty much do for fun in our free time. Any more questions? I think they really are hungry. Well, if you have any more questions, please uh, catch him at lunch or later on. Uh, just a reminder there, uh, tomorrow evening after the whole thing, we will gather at MetaLab for some more talks. And we would like to encourage you to do some lightning talk on your own topic. And of course, when he's around, ask him more questions there. And tune into IRC Channel DeepSec for direct feedback. 
As for now, enjoy your lunch and I hope to see you back after the break here in Pirouette and Astera will be taking over the session. Thank you very much and thank you.